Hi, and welcome to this rendering lecture. This time we will talk about the rendering equation. My name is Adam Zillerik. As always, let's start with an overview. So the rendering equation is what describes the light scattering in all of the scene. We will first look at some intuition and then we will look at three different formulations of the rendering equations. They are all more or less equivalent, but they look at the problem from different angles and therefore I hope that you will get a, a good understanding on what is what. So for the intuition, let's look at this scene. I improvised it, uh, so I had uh, the full control of the scene. We have here a box with a light source and a hole and we have three paper walls. The light, which means photons, are emitted from the light source they uh, are cast onto this wall, then the photons are reflected, for instance, onto this wall and on the bottom. Then there is also some interreflection between those walls. And finally, from all those positions, the photons reach the camera. We want to do a simulation of these photons. We want to find methods that we can use in the computer to simulate light. There are many of such methods to simulate photons. One of them would be to really take photons. They are emitted and whenever they hit a surface, a certain information is stored on the surface, which is then cast into the camera. This is called photon mapping. Another method is radiosity, which stores uh, the information as well in the surfaces for the whole scene, but in a slightly different way. But what we can also do is trace paths for the photons. So here we started a path from the light source, it hit this surface. After that, we sample a direction on the hemisphere. In this case, we sampled this direction and we reached that wall. And uh, finally, we can also do some important sampling, which would be, for instance, sampling the camera. But it can be also completely random. Anyways, uh, the goal is to find a complete path from the light source towards the camera. Other paths can be sampled in the same way. And finally, when a path reaches uh, the camera, it reaches a certain pixel. So in that pixel, we have to add up. We have to add up the photons. So we have adding up, so we have uh, integration. However, this is uh, not the only way we can do this integration. We can uh, start at the camera in the same way. Cast a ray and uh, it reaches a certain point. We integrate over the hemisphere and look for all the incoming light. So this is the same thing in reverse. Instead of looking where the light goes, we are looking where the light is coming from. So again, let's say we uh, reach this surface after that we reach that, and now we have the full path. Only a full path, so a path connecting the sensor and the light source, is a measurement. So only these paths can have a contribution. If there is some sort of a blocking element, then there is zero contribution. And the same method can be also used to sample other paths. And what you have to realize, is that uh, when we sample, for instance, this surface and then this surface, on every reflection we col collect some factors for the material, for the cosine, for other things, and finally we multiply them all together and then we multiply them with the radiance of the light source. This is called tracing importance. It is the adjoint operation to tracing photons or bundles of photons. So let's look at the uh, mental picture we had before. We started at the light and we started tracing, let's say, a bundle of photons. It reached the surface and it was reflected, for instance, here. On every reflection, some of the photons were lost. So th those are multiplication factors and these multipl multiplication factors account for the attenuation that happens to the photons uh, on the way to the camera. In the same way, we can say 
that we start at the camera and instead of tracing photons, we trace importance or importons. And again, similar to tracing photons, the importance attenuates until it reaches the light. So you really have to realize that those are two views of the same thing. It is also called an adjoint operation. So that was it for the intuition. To recap, photons are emitted from the light sources, reflected by surfaces in the scene until they reach a sensor. And uh, in rendering, we can go the opposite way. We can trace importance until they reach a light source. So next, we will have a recap of what we already saw in the light lecture. And after that, we will go straight to the recursive formulation. This is the recap. We want to compute the light which is going into the direction of a V. And to do that, we integrate over the hemisphere. And uh, we look for light which is uh, coming from direction omega. And omega is on the hemisphere. We multiply with the factors from the material, which is modeled by the BRDF. We multiply with the cosine, uh, taking account of the uh, incoming angle, and then we have the solid angle. This is what we already know. The first thing that we have to add is light emittance. Imagine the camera is uh, directed right at the light source, then the emitted light will be the dominating factor. Some light sources have a large radiance at certain positions or in certain directions. Thing of a headlamp in a car. Therefore, the emittance E depends on the position and the direction. The right part of the sum is the same as before. We integrate over the hemisphere, we look into all the directions omega, and we measure the light coming from that di direction. We weigh it by the cosine and we multiply with the material VRDF. But how do we get the radiance coming from direction omega? What can we do? Well, this is named the recursive formulation, so probably we will get it recursively. We can sample a ray on the hemisphere, like shown here. This is the first bounce. We add the light emitted from the surface, which is zero. Then we sample uh, something on the hemisphere. We reach this point. We again uh, have the same formula. So again, this same formula, but this time, this was our first x and this is our next x. And we again want to integrate over the whole hemisphere. So we again sample this light and then we again, it's a re recursive problem, so we sample this. And here we have an actual emission. But we still need to go uh, further and continue the recursion because actually some of the light can also be reflected back on the light source. Okay? Right. Any questions? Yes, the cat has a question. But first, we make a change in notation. Look at accident, emitted and incident radiance. We now use arrows in here, here and here to show the direction of photons. However, omega in here, still points away from point X. We also changed the name of the differential. We added a 1. But this is just a variable name, so we can uh, do anything. As said, we make recursion. This is one expansion of such a recursion. We are standing on position X and want to know how much light is coming from direction omega which actually represents the whole hemisphere. From a mathematical standpoint, we are not sending rays, at least not a finite number of rays. We integrate over the whole hemisphere. However, in the spirit of Monte Carlo and as a mental picture, we can trace a ray into direction omega 1 to look what there is. We hit a point x2 and we can compute the accident radiance for omega 2, which is negative omega 1. But here we have incoming radiance. 
while here we have excitant radians. Is that the same? We had that already in the lecture about light. Back then we were looking at radians. Radians is the differential flux measured in watts. So think about the number of photons per unit projected area per solid angle. dA projected accounts for tilting the surface dA. Uh, so this is the cosine rule. And dA projected is the cross section of the beam of light. The omega means that we are looking at an infinitesimal angle. Therefore, we are looking at the amount of energy, so the number of photons, that are flying into the direction d omega in a beam of width dA projected. All right? We calculate the differential flux that is sent from area differential A2 towards area differential A1. This answers the question about how much energy leaves dA2. You can see the calculation at the bottom. d omega 2 is the solid angle subtended by dA1 as seen from dA2. So this is the projection of dA1 onto the hemisphere of dA2. Photons don't make turns, so all energy sent from dA2 towards direction d omega 2 will reach dA1. L is the radiance sent by dA2 into the direction of dA1. This is the cross section of the beam at the start. And the fraction in here is just a solid angle. So dA1 projected onto the hemisphere. Okay, let's now look at our receiver. We have a very similar computation here. This is the radiance received by dA1 from directions d omega 1. We again have to compute the projected area of dA1 and the solid angle d omega 1. Let's put those two equations right next to each other. As said, we know that photons don't make turns, not in vacuum at least. Therefore, both of the d phi, so this, this is the amount of energy, are the same and we can equate the top equation with the bottom one. We quickly see that all the factors but the radians are the same. Hence, the amount of radiance which is uh, going from x2 towards direction omega2 is the same amount of radiance received from x1 in directions omega1. Let's look at the recursive formulation again. Okay, cool. So those two are equal. And we can plug this right into here. The cat is happy. Okay. The whole thing again. We start at the camera and we shoot a ray. We get a hit point. We get the emitted light for that hit point and then we integrate over the hemisphere. During this integration we shoot another ray into direction omega 1. We get another hit point and we again for the second hit point we evaluate the emitted light and we integrate over the hemisphere. And we again, we shoot into the direction omega. And now we might hit a light. Realize that this problem is infinitely dimensional. It's not possible to write an analytical solution for any practical scene. We have to solve this thing numerically. Monte Carlo can deal with many dimensions, but still in practice, we have to stop at some point. And we will learn soon how to do that in an unbiased way, where unbiased means that we will have the correct result on average. As said, 
This is the adjoint method. We are tracing importons. And yes, the very same integral also works for photons. In that case, this emission is the camera sensor emitting importance. And for every sensor element, we emit this importance separately. We would then measure how much importance reaches the light surfaces. Multiplied with the amount of emitted light, this would give us the same value. And we would be able to update the corresponding pixel that sent the emission. This might sound extremely inefficient, but that isn't the case. Just like we can sample a light source directly, we could also sample the camera directly. And the method becomes feasible. In fact, certain effects, like for instance caustics, might be easier to render using this strategy. The recursive formulation of the rendering equation was first published by this guy, I don't know how to pronounce his name, at SIGGRAPH 1986. This is the most important formulation of the rendering equation and it is used for path tracing, which is the most common algorithm for physically based rendering. All of the Hollywood studios, for instance, they use path tracing. But path tracing or even Monte Carlo is not the only method to solve uh, the rendering equations. We will uh, see other methods later. So to summarize again, the excitant light of a certain point X into direction V is the light emitted plus the integral over the hemisphere of the light incident over all of the angles times the cosine weighting times the BRDF. And now we will look at the operator formulation. Neat, isn't it? Let's have a look what the symbols mean. First, st let's start with the L. This is a notation that represents the light distribution in the scene. Think of radiant stored on surfaces. This is the emitted light, a description of where light is emitted. And finally, this is the transport operator. We will look in one of the next slides into the details, but just think of it as the whole simulation of light. In here, we have written this in terms of radiance, so photons or light propagation. But a, a very similar formulation is also possible for importance. And instead of the light transport operator, we would have the adjoint operator. Do you see what this is? L on the left and on the right is the same thing. So we are looking for a solution where light propagation is in equilibrium. This is quite similar to uh, something like x equals a plus bx or similar things uh, for matrix problems. In fact, this is also a linear system but with functions instead of simple vectors. And here we have such a linear system for scalars. We start with a equal, equals 1.5, b 0.7, x is 1, and then we iterate. And we see that uh, this converges closer and closer to our solution for x. This only works because b is smaller than 1. And see, this has a very similar form to our light equation. We have the x in here, we have a certain a, and we have an operator, which is the b, and x again. And uh, the very same iterative method is also used to solve certain matrix problems, and it can be used to solve the light transport equation. So let's have a closer look what this light transport operator is. It consists of a local scattering operator. The outgoing light is the scattering times the incoming light. And uh, this operator accommodates, for instance, for material properties. This is the propagation operator. It turns outgoing radiance into incoming radiance, which means that this operator is responsible for all of the ray tracing. Compared to the recursive formulation, these operators are in reverse. Before, we were tracing importons, starting from the camera. Here, on the other hand, we work on light waves. They are propagated in epochs throughout all of the scene. But again, 
you can look at the problem from two directions and you can define adjoint versions of both formulations of the rendering equation. Okay, so as said, these uh, operators are linear and cats can cook with linear operators. They love cooking with uh, linear things. And look what they come up with. We can reformulate this into such a thing and then we get a solution operator like this. All right. And it turns out that the solution operator, the inversion of this is an infinite sum of the identity plus the transport operator, the tr transport uh, operator squared, etc. And when we apply the solution operator, we get the solution. The light distribution in the scene is the emitted light. In a way, the photons stored on the uh, light surfaces plus this light scattered once, plus this light scattered twice, thrice, etc. Until infinity. And all of this works, so the inversion and this iteration works only because the norm of this uh, transport operator for uh, to the power of some k is smaller than 1. And for a valid scene model. Let's take a look how this looks in practice. In here, we have a very famous uh, Cornell scene, and this is the emitted light. After scattering it once, we get this. So this is direct lighting. Scattering it twice is one bounce reflection. And we can see that it becomes weaker when scattering more often. And in here, we see that this is in a way dull because it's only direct light. While when we go further to the right, the scene becomes a bit brighter. Well, logically, because we are adding these components but it also becomes, in a way, more realistic. And this becoming less bright, this is exactly because the norm of the transport operator is smaller than 1. And it actually, when we only have non-specular materials, so this is only diffuse materials, um, the transport operator to the power of 1 is actually smaller than 1. So this is a harder condition. And the uh, corollary of this is that specular materials, and in particular refractive materials, need a longer expansion of this sum to produce a realistic result. And this is also logical when you uh, think of glass or something. The light is not attenuated, and so you need to find all of the reflections inside the glass thing until you get your realistic result. All right? Okay, so uh, we only scratched the surface of this uh, operator formulation. It is all based on uh, Veach's uh, PhD thesis. He's a really famous guy in the uh, rendering community. He did it quite rigorous and in-depth, and I find it super insightful. Do not confuse this operator formulation with Hackbert's notation of, uh, for light paths. I will just cover it very briefly in here. So uh, the notation says L for light source, D for a diffuse reflection, S for a specular reflection, and E for the eye or for the camera. So LDE would mean that the path starts at the light, it goes to one diffuse surface and then directly to the camera. So this is a direct lighting light path, or this thing. All right, and uh, this would be a two bounds uh, reflection. This is this one. Light starts at the light source, it goes to one wall, it goes to another wall, and then to the camera. And finally, this is a caustic path. A caustic path means a, a path that uh, has several uh, specular reflections. We will uh, see later what the implications are, 
but just uh, know that this is not the same as the operator formulation of light transport. All right. This was the operator formulation for light transport. We have the light distribution in the scene, which equals the emitted light in the scene plus the transport uh, operator times the light in the scene. And uh, this reaches the equilibrium after some point in which it describes the light distribution. It's always good to have different viewpoints. Sometimes uh, it uh, gives you an easier notation and an uh, easier way to reason about things. This notation is also used in the radiosity method for global Ill illumination. So this is one of the finite element methods. We discretize the scene into small patches. We uh, compute this equation. We iterate several times until we get uh, only very small updates and then we are done. This method was for instance used in Max Payne. There are some uh, more details in, in the slides from Jako Lechtinen. Maybe we will also cover it in one of the future lectures, but for now that's it. And now let's go to the path integral formulation. Look at it with all its glory. Yet another reformulation of the same rendering equation. But you probably want to know what the components are. This is just an overview. We will look into each component in detail in the next slides. The result, ij, is the measurement, that is, the brightness or color for a certain sensor pixel. The pixel is indicated by j. We integrate over the set of all transport paths of all lengths. These paths are written as x bar. The measure is the differential that is needed for integration. And finally, fj is the measurement contribution function. Here we see an example of a path. It connects the light over three vertices with the camera. The light source and the camera are also vertices. We can describe a path as a list of vertices. And as said, we are integrating over the set of all possible paths. The shortest possible path would be a direct connection between the light source and the camera, consisting of just two vertices. The longest possible path would be of infinite length, so it's actually not possible in the computer. The measure is a bit abstract for now. Think about it like it is responsible for generating the samples and their probability density function, which are necessary for the Monte Carlo integration. Therefore, it depends on the path. It can be expanded to a product of area measures or area differentials one area differential for each vertex. It will become clearer later. Let's now look at the measurement contribution function fj. fj is a product of several factors. The light emission Le, which is simply the brightness of the light at position x0, a geometry factors between each pair of vertices and Actually, let's uh, look into these geometry factors right now. They are pretty interesting. So G consists of the visibility term, the sending and receiving cosine, and the distance between uh, the vertices squared. Huh. Compare those geometry factors we, with what we had before in physics, when we were looking at differential flux. Computing, it requires the cosine at both sides and the distance squared. But it is nowhere to be found in the recursive formulation. Why is that? Let's look into it. In the recursive formulation, and also when we compute direct lighting using hemisphere sampling, we integrate over the hemisphere, capital omega. We do that by shooting virtual rays. They are virtual because we are still in math mode. They have to do with differentials and all this integration magic. So we have an infinite amount of these rays and the density of rays is continuous. I hope the visualization is okay. The density of these rays is reduced by the same distance squared law as photon density when emitting light, which I explained in the second lecture. When the virtual rays hit a tilted surface, the cosine rule 
comes into effect, again for the same reason as with photons, so the density is further reduced by the tilted surface. And this means that the missing cosine and distance squared is actually embedded in ray casting. This also fits together well with what I said about the adjoint operation of tracing photons, tracing importons. Just as photons follow the laws of distance squared and cosine, importons also do. Another way to look at it is to extend the solid angle d omega as a cone. That way it finds exactly what would be projected on the unit hemisphere. The tip of this cone is at the center of the hemisphere. At a unit distance it has a cross section of d omega, exactly the differential solid angle. While it extends along the ray, the area becomes larger at, the, at a rate of distance squared. And when projecting it onto a tilted surface, the area becomes larger by a factor of 1 over cosine of uh, theta. So the area at the destination is this one. When we compute the probability density, we have to compute 1 over the area, uh, which means that we arrive at this term. Just as we can map a sample from a surface to the hemisphere and compute its probability in the domain of the hemisphere, we can do the same thing vice versa. We are trying to show you the same thing from different angles. For some people one angle might work better than the other. So it's, I really explained the same thing twice. And we hope that eventually it will make sense to all of you. Okay, one more. This page is exactly what we had in the lecture about light, when we made the change of variables and integrated over the surface of the light, hence the dA. I'll quickly go over the factors. We have the outgoing light into direction V, which equals the integral uh, over all of the surfaces of the lights. Uh, we have the material, which is multiplied with the light intensity at position Y on the surface. We have the visibility, the receiver cosine, the emitter cosine, and the distance squared. And hey, actually, a very similar equation could be used as a second variant of the recursive formulation. We would just have to add light emission in front of the integral and then we could plug in this one which is accident radiance at point x right into here which is also accident radiance and voila we have a recursive formulation based on uh, surface sampling. We again see a similar situation two cosines distance squared and even a visibility term, as in the g-term of the path integral formulation. Okay, uh, let's go back there. You don't know all the components yet. Again from the start, fj, the measurement contribution function, is a product of the light emission Le, geometry factors between each pair of vertices, the scattering factors fs, uh, for each inner vertex, or in other words, for each reflection point, uh, which model the material. And finally, we have the importance emission from the camera, this one. Remember that we said that we can look at light transport from two different directions, either photons emitted from the light source going to the camera, or importons emitted from the camera going towards the light source. I'm not aware of a case where uh, WE is not 1, tell me if you know something, but we keep it there for symmetry. Wait, compare the path integral uh, formulation on top with the direct light surface equation on the bottom. Material, light emission and the geometry term are pretty much the same. And here we have the uh, differential for the surface of the light. Uh, 
And this is very similar to this area measure. Ha! The measure in the path integral formulation is a product of uh, area differentials. So the whole integral is integrating over all the surfaces at once. Similar to dA itself, to the area differential itself, which integrates over du and dv, the u uv coordinates, or the omega in the hemisphere, which integrates over d phi and d theta at the same time. So it integrates over two angles at the same time. So the path integral formulation is really just an integral which integrates over all of the surfaces at the same time. Let's take a closer look at the integration domain now. It can be subdivided of paths of length 1, where there are zero intermediate vertices in the scene, so this is uh, directly the connection between the light source and the camera, with one vertex inside the scene, etc. This is in a way the same as the light emitted from the light source. However, it's just in a way the same, because in here this is a uh, integration domain, in here this is a light distribution. And uh, in this integration domain, in this uh, path integral, we also have the function of the camera. We have uh, the projected the light into the camera, while this only describes the distribution in the scene. And then similarly, if there is one reflection, this is direct lighting, so there is just one bounce, etc. This notation is agnostic to how the path was generated. It can be, for instance, that we generate this first two vertices from the light source. So we have a certain light, we sample a direction, we hit this one, we sample another direction, we hit this one. This path, uh, this point was sampled from the camera, and then we just do the connection. So there are many ways on how we can generate those paths. And this framework is agnostic to that. So this means that we can uh, compute the probability of a path in one united framework, no matter how it is sampled. And this allows us to do MIS between uh, different sampling strategies. So it can be that uh, those two vertices are easier to sample from the camera. So if this vertex was actually sampled from the light source, uh, if we don't do MIS, this would uh, produce a lot of variance. But since all of this is in one single framework, we can uh, compute MIS for this path, and we can uh, reduce variance between different sampling strategies. Another thing where this uh, representation shines is for Metropolis Light Transport, or MLT in short. In MLT, we have correlated samples, where now one sample is a full connection between the light source and the camera. So uh, correlated samples means that we can derive the next sample from a previous one. If we found a sample that has a large contribution of light, we can uh, change it just slightly and explore this part of the integration domain. I'm pretty certain that we will go more uh, in depth of MLT, and uh, so I will uh, stop now. But uh, just note that this formulation is very useful for a lot of problems. To wrap up, the path integral formulation provides a cleaner notation, and it is easier to handle with more complex algorithms than just path tracing. And path tracing we will see in the next lecture. It is a framework for computing probability densities on paths. This allows MIS across path generation directions. And this is a prerequisite for bidirectional path tracing. And it is also necessary for Metropolis light transport. All of that was based on uh, Eric Veach's PhD thesis. Again, we just scratched the, the surface. And I really recommend to read his thesis. It, it is well written and I'm a huge fan. For me, it's really the Bible of 
physically based rendering. Okay, as a summary, the path integral formulation computes a measurement for a certain pixel as the integral over the whole path space of all paths of all possible lengths of the measurement contribution function. Next time we will uh, go into path tracing and if you want to have more information about the stuff that we covered in this lecture, go to Veach. Thank you.